Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 24th of March and I hope that here, if you're in the UK, you've been enjoying the beautiful weather that we've been having here over the last day or two for here. I have been enjoying a little bit of it, only mitigated by the fact that I've got my first cold in however many years since COVID is not COVID, but it kind of, we haven't been in much contact with people. Um, but now that we're getting back into uh, contact, it kind of, it turns out that one can get colds again. Um, so kind of, if you hear me being, uh, sounding a little bunged up, that is the reason. But apart from that, it's a great joy to be back with you today. And thank you as ever for tuning in to our 30 minutes of Q&A about the ancient world, where we delve into all your curious and fantastic questions um, about what it was like in the ancient world. And we are going to start off with one that's actually focused on ancient literature, and which I hoped to have got to last time we met, but didn't have the chance to talk about. And we're going to be, so it's the question by um, from Callum Henry, who's asking particularly about the Aeneid as that great, Virgil's Aeneid, as that great Roman epic, the Roman uh, answer to the Iliad and the Odyssey, mixing elements of both. Thank you, Sarah, for good wishes about the cold. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. It kind of has that feeling of sort of swimming slightly through fog um, as we go forward. Um, so Callum Henry uh, kind of uh, asked, how convincing of a hero do we think Aeneas is? And would you argue that Turnus is a better hero or not? So here we have the crucial question, which actually has plagued so many people reading the Aeneid. The Aeneid is a story about, as you might have guessed from the title, Aeneas, the great hero who starts off in Troy and will, through many ventures, come to end up in Italy, where he will find his base, uh, where fate has decreed that he must go, and where eventually he and his descendants will give rise to the people of Rome. And so his journey is, is a pretty much a, a, a fated one where he has to learn uh, and become uh, okay with and comfortable with his, his fate and his destiny um, as much as those he interacts with have to become okay and comfortable with his destiny. And some do that better than others. Um, so of course we know about Aeneas and Dido, his great love from Carthage, who effectively he has to realise he has to leave, he has to move on, that is what the gods have decried, um, and poor old Dido is left um, alone in Carthage, absolutely and utterly bereft. Um, and then Turnus, where does Turnus come in? Well Turnus is in Italy, and he is the chap that turns up, he's the hero of the town, uh, and the area where Aeneas eventually turns up, and Aeneas and Turnus have to end up, of course, locked in mortal combat. And Turnus himself has to also realise that fate has decreed that he is not this time going to be the winner. So, Callum, what do you guys think? Um, who is your particular hero or favourite? If you've got uh, an insight into the Aeneid, you know, how convincing a hero is Aeneas? Well, it all depends on what we define as a hero, doesn't it, Callum? Like, what do we expect our heroes to be? Now, obviously, those reading and listening to the Aeneid would have the Iliad and the Odyssey in the background with two very different kinds of heroes. We've got Achilles in the Iliad who makes the heroic choice to have that short, heroic, glorious life rather than the long, unglorious one. But frankly, is is a bit selfish as he spends most of the book sitting crying um, on the shoreline because um, people aren't giving him the honour he thinks he deserves. Um, but And then he returns to the fight with a, a, a sort of sense of kind of impending doom about him and his existence. Odysseus, on the other hand, is the perpetual survivor, the man who's determined to make it home and by wily, uh, difficult and uh, ways, that kind of Greek of the polytropon, um, manages to survive and make his way back home where he then reasserts his position very, very dominantly. Um, Leah says, isn't the bigger question, which of them is the more important figure, heroic or otherwise, in the prehistory of Rome? Another great way of framing the question. Kind of, so, you know, what do you want your hero to be? Depends a little bit on where you are. are. We as modern audiences reading this enjoy these as works of literature. Which do we find more convincing kind of uh, reflects mainly on us and our convictions about what are the key qualities. Turnus is as some, he is ferocious, he is strong, he is powerful, he has great courage, etc. But he also has a rage and a pride that betrays him on the battlefield. And it's only as he learns his fate that he really starts to become much more at peace with himself. And so one could argue that as he dies, he actually becomes the most heroic um, individual uh, of the story. Whereas Aeneas gradually too 
ha has to fulfill that destiny and learn what destiny has to fulfill, but he has to do pretty awful things in the meantime to be able to continue it. So which was the more important figure, as Lee puts it, in the prehistory of Rome? Who would Romans, sitting there listening to these stories, have wanted to follow or have been thought that they should follow? I think it was very much supposed to be Aeneas. De Virgil was writing this uh, kind of very much in the time when Rome was converting, obviously, to empire under Augustus. This was a story about people putting the state, the system, the society, their world, their culture before themselves as an individual. Um, and that is ultimately kind of what Aeneas has to learn. It's not necessarily something we might determine as heroic today. But I, for me, that's the message um, that perhaps the Aeneid was supposed to um, bring to its Roman audience, the sacrifice that was required for Rome from everyone. So Callum and Lee, thank you so much indeed for your question. Uh, question. Great question to kick off with a bit of literature. Um, but we are going to move on quickly and, and sort of morph around the Roman world to Patricia Anderson's question. Simply, have I ever been to Libya? No, I have not, Patricia. And I would dearly, dearly, dearly love to be able to go. There was a moment in time back in uh, the early 2000s when suddenly cruise ships were stopping in Libya all the time. Uh, people were going on great visits to the amazing ancient sites there of Cyrene. The ancient Greek colony uh, started um, kind of in the, well, in the 6th century or earlier BCE, uh, and then which was the thriving settlement right the way through the rest of antiquity, but also the site of Leptis Magna. And these sites have remained in extraordinary, astonishing condition. Um, to be able to visit and yet no I didn't manage to get there before Libya was swept off the tourist accessible board by international politics and war and has never really returned. Um, so it is one of my great great sadnesses that I have not been able to get to uh, Libya. If anyone oh, look, listening today has been able to get to Libya um, and has had seen in person those great sites of Cyrene and Leptis Magna, then please 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 Tell us your thoughts, what it was like to be able to walk in those ruins, because I would dearly love um, to experience that one day. And all fingers and toes crossed that we will be able to um, again one day. Um, Bill uh, Harlock has also come in asking about uh, what um, the remains of ancient sites, but uh, on very much a underwater basis. So what Bill's question is this, why has only a small amount of underwater archaeology been done at the naval battle sites of Salamis or Actium, looking for the remains of ships, bronze, rams, etc. This is a really interesting question, Bill. Thank you so much for this. And partly it's a question of what we think might have survived for us to find. Partly it's a question of the expense and the difficulty of the excavation. Um, and partly it's also a kind of a difficulty in terms of navigating what can be now very, very busy waterways. So in terms of Salamis, actually, if you go to Salamis today, it is an absolute minefield to uh, manoeuvre around the narrow channel between the island of Salamis and the mainland of Greece because it is a major shipping route as a, a part of the larger kind of port of Athens at the Piraeus. And there are extraordinarily uh, big and very terrifying um, tankers and ships and cargo ships um, all based there. Now, I remember back in 2008, one of the first pieces of uh, filming we did, we actually went out on a small speedboat up and around the Salamis channel to put ourselves in the location of the battle from which to film and it was absolutely terrifying having these enormous enormous ships um, moving past you and we were very restricted in what we were able to do but there has been some interesting work uh, kind of not so much looking for the remains of ancient ships at Salamis but actually just trying to map what the uh, uh, the channel looks like underneath the water um, and what that has shown is that it's a lot narrower um, than kind of it looks like from the surface in terms of navigable space. And this is kind of factored back into what we think it might have been like two and a half thousand years ago. Um, and uh, kind of it, people have understood that actually, unless you had really good detailed knowledge of this channel, i.e. you rode it quite often, you would very easily come a cropper and end up grounded. And of course, who knew this channel better than anyone else? the Greek and particularly Athenian fleets did, rather than the Persians, for whom this was very much foreign land. Um, so we kind of understand that the, the Greeks and particularly the Athenian triremes did two really important things. By drawing everyone in to the Salamis narrow channel, it was narrow, so the larger Persian numbers 
couldn't count for much, but equally drawing them into a narrow channel that was deceptively narrow, unless you really knew the waterways yourself, the Athenians gave themselves a distinct advantage. And the other thing that they're supposed to have done is drawn all of their triremes out of the water for a period of time before the battle so they could dry out on the sand. Um, and then when they put them back into the water, they were not waterlogged timbered ships. They were much, as a result, faster and more manoeuvrable, whereas the Persian ships had been in the water all the way on their long journey um, around the oceans to get to Salamis and with us were le less manoeuvrable within a narrow channel, which they did not know well enough to be able to navigate. So it was brilliant strategy um, on behalf of the Athenians and others at Salamis. Clive makes the point about legal protection now quite tight for marine sites. Yes, getting much, much, much better um, in every way, shape and form. But the other point, Bill, is that kind of actually, what are we going to expect to survive here? Uh, the, the wood of the timbers of the actual triremes would not survive at all in the sort of depths and salty water conditions that there are at most battle sites. That's very different to somewhere like the Black Sea, where you may have come across the Black Sea mapping project. Um, and what they've done there is send absolutely extraordinary pieces of high tech deep, deep, deep down to the bottom of the Black Sea, which is much, much, much deeper than the areas we're talking about with Salamis or Actium, um, and which has a very particular fresh and salt water combination but which means that down deep, deep, deep actually would, can and has survived. And not just would, but actually the ropes are, that were once on these ships um, attached to their masts have survived. And they've actually found down there at the bottom of the Black Sea, a fourth century, we think fourth century BC Greek ship um, in almost, you know, kind of usable condition, one might say, uh, kind of absolutely extraordinary that they have survived there. But that kind of survival just does not happen um, in uh, the uh, kind of in the areas of Salamis and Actium that we're talking about in the wider Mediterranean. But on the other hand, those bronze rams, you're absolutely right, will have survived. The question is, to what extent do we want to go through the complex and expensive business of uh, underwater archaeology to retrieve a ram, which will probably look to a certain extent quite similar to another ram. But there have been really interesting projects doing this off Sicily and looking at some of the Carthaginian versus Roman sea battle sites. And they've brought up some absolutely extraordinary um, bronze rams that are kind of crushed in one way or another, showing the heat and intensity of the battle. Um, so I think there's definitely room for more here, Bill, and I'm fully behind you that we need to do more of this. Um, but the technology needs to be there. The, the money and support needs to be there. The ability uh, to kind of manoeuvre in the area needs to be there. And the actual kind of conditions of the sea and down at the bottom of the sea um, need to be right for there to be stuff surviving for us to go for. Sarah Scotty asked another question. We are zooming through the questions today. Um, by today's standard, were the Romans or the, and the Greeks carbon neutral and eco-friendly? Ooh, interesting question, Sarah. Thank you so much for this. Why were the, were the Romans and the Greeks carbon neutral and eco-friendly? So definitely not, I think, carbon neutral. Um, in that, at the end of the day, there was an awful lot of burning of stuff that went on and a lot of kind of high air manufacturing of materials um, that required huge heats. You know, thinking of their weaponry, for instance, thinking of all the pottery kilns, etc. Um, in the Greek world, kind of, but this is happening on f roughly, compared to modern standards, fairly um, small beer, right? Fairly small numbers. If we're thinking a population of Athens um, at its height, 50,000 male citizens plus wives and children, about 200,000 plus a slave population of another couple of hundred thousand. These are not, in modern terms, big. So actually, kind of, even though they are not working in carbon neutral or particularly eco-friendly ways, um, they're not probably having that much of an impact on the environment. When we start thinking about Rome and the first city of a million people, then we start to get into slightly kind of bigger figures. And actually, kind of, there were enormous problems uh, within Rome in trying to make sure that, not necessarily thinking about in carbon neutral terms, but certainly living in some kind of symbiotic relationship with the local environment and with nature in terms of the water supply, in terms of the sanitation, in terms of the drainage, in terms of the annual flooding of the Tiber um, and the resultant malarial outbreaks. All of this had to be considered um, uh, to ensure that actually Rome could survive as a city. So I wouldn't call them carbon neutral, um, but uh, I, and in some ways compared to us, I would call them eco-friendly, um, but over and above probably not having the sort of impact um, that uh, kind of we consider ourselves uh, to have today and thus as a result needing to think much more carefully and seriously about issues like carbon neutrality and um, being much more eco-friendly. In terms of um, their ideas around reuse, 
however. I think there's a lot for us to, to learn um, in terms of how we know that objects were um, repurposed, repaired, reused, rather than chucking out and going for the new. Um, and in fact, the ancient Greeks were well known for having a slight overwhelming suspicion about the new. Um, so from that perspective of reuse and repair, I think we can definitely learn a lot from them. And William Moulton's asking, didn't, the, uh, didn't Athens have laws against tree cutting? Ooh, interesting. Um, kind of this would be, I, I'm trying to think where this would be. Is this an inscriptional evidence? William, let us know um, where you have this. It might certainly be within sacred areas, within religious spaces, within sanctuaries where you couldn't actually get rid of anything because it all belonged to the god. Um, that would be one example um, that I could think of uh, immediately. But then um, actually as well, thinking about um, the provision of particular things for particular events so there would have been a sacred olive grove that provided all the olive oil for those who won at the Athenian Panathenaic Games for instance and you weren't supposed to use that olive oil for anything else um, apart from that a lawsuit says William yeah it'd be really interesting to see kind of whether people were going at one another um, for taking down each other's property so might this have been to do with property be really interesting to involve a little bit Samantha says absolutely kind of a smaller population would have meant the eco impact would have been less yes absolutely definitely in the Greek world by the time you get into those cities of a million people like Rome itself um, actually I think we can argue that the impact would have been quite uh, substantial and we see that only increasing over time with the Tiber great river of Rome being quite a smelly and disgusting place just like the Thames was in London um, for so long and only has been cleaned up in relatively recent times um, when we've realized we can't just get away um, with pumping all our rubbish out into the river. So Sarah brilliant question really really interesting thank you so much indeed but I want to move on to a whole series of questions um, that uh, have been, uh, it seems, um, kind of inspired by uh, me saying that I was off on my stag do the last time uh, I spoke to you all. I promise you this is not me still recovering from my stag do. I have indeed got a cold, as I was saying to those of you who joined us right at the beginning um, of uh, the uh, session. Um, but Tracy Rabbiotti has been in touch asking about uh, stag party and whether they had stag parties in antiquity. Um, and then that we've also had questions coming in about uh, from Latifa Walker about how were women that did not have children for whatever reason regarded within the ancient world. And we've had questions from Mariam Zaidi asking about marriage counselling. Um, and did the Oracle of Delphi work as a marriage counsellor? How did partners resolve their issues? Um, and do we have examples of marriage counsellors in ancient civilization, or is it a modern concept? So there's a whole series of questions here um, around the kind of the institution of marriage and the different kind of uh, things that one could get up to um, both before, during and after and if indeed one didn't um, get married what to come back to. So this is going to be the, the focus of the second half of our time together today bringing all of these um, together. So before we get on to those questions though I just want to do our kind of in the news and what's on section and all of these things that we'll be flagging to you um, on the Facebook page, obviously. But some of the things that I've particularly enjoyed over the last couple of weeks. So from The Guardian, um, the Roman boat that sank in the Mediterranean. We were talking about our underwater archaeology. 1,700 years ago, gives up its treasures. Um, a boat carrying hundreds of amphorae of wine, olives, oil and garum. The dear old Roman fish paste. Came to grief during a stopover in Mallorca. Mallorca. The merchant vessel... Probably at the at anchor in the Bay of Palma, while en route from southwest Spain to Italy, was quickly swallowed by the waves and buried in the sand of the shallow seabed, but has now been rediscovered. Absolutely fabulous. Um, from live science, an ancient sacred pool lined with temples and altars has been discovered on a Sicilian island. Um, so this is the University of Rome, uh, Sapienza University of Rome, um, that has been looking at uh, kind of um, this uh, kind of an artificial lake, 2,500 year old artificial lake. Um, that had been a sacred pool aligned with and reflected starlight from certain constellations um, rather than being, as it was previously thought, an inner harbour for military or trading purposes. Um, this was have been the centrepiece of a giant sanctuary um, and the Phoenicians built the pool. This is on this city, the island of Motia in the 6th century BC. So some of you who might have been watching my recent Sicily show that was re-shown on BBC2, we were in Motia. We were looking at the great site the Carthaginians had and the Phoenicians had uh, built there during their period of influence on the western side of the island before the Greeks started um, from their base on the eastern side of the island to expand 
their interest and control across the island and really sort of chased out the Carthaginians, Phoenicians. Motia, um, absolutely brilliant, near where they do the salt panning today. Um, this is the kind of the sacred pool, uh, which uh, rather that, a sacred pool rather than a uh, kind of um, inner harbour. Um, which it kind of is so much more interesting, isn't it? Absolutely fabulous. And then back in Britain, from the Newcastle Chronicle, Hadrian's Wall in Newcastle, a new film that follows the wall's real route through the city. You can follow exactly through Newcastle where Hadrian's Wall um, was going. And this is all part of the celebrations this year for the 1900th anniversary of Hadrian's Wall. Get involved and have a look at that film if you can. Um, and then what's on? We've got some free online events. Ways to Die in Roman London. Caroline Lawrence, absolutely brilliant, is doing Ways to Die in Roman London. That's next Tuesday, the 29th of March. Um, and uh, then can I also flag that if you are in the Coventry area and want uh, in the on the 19th, 20th or 21st of April, then you must come along to our Resonate Festival that's being held at the University of Warwick because there are a whole host of events, all free, going on across those, those days in the evening of the 19th and the 21st, all day on the 20th, which is a, a, ch a child-friendly day, all ages, come along, tons of stuff for kids as well as for adults, all through the day, all free. And there's going to be some definitely brilliant classics events. So we've got a Roman cookery project going on. Um, we've got an actual kind of demonstration of ancient music um, going on. And there'll be me talking about fake news in ancient Athens as well. Um, so have a look at the Resonate Festival and have a look at some of those events. And do come along and say hello if you can. And we will in fact be doing our next Q&A on the 21st of April, live from the University of Warwick, just an hour or so before I go on stage to do my um, live event on fake news in ancient Athens on the 21st. So I'll be doing that 6 to 7 p.m. on the 21st, but before that, 5 p.m., we'll be coming live from the university to do the Q&A, um, and we'll see if we can rope in any of my fellow presenters from the ancient world to that as well. Um, so do come along if you can, and if not, do join in the Q&A um, beforehand. Amazing podcasts out there at the moment. Tons of stuff coming out. There's a nice one on Helen of Troy coming out with a History Hit podcast. Um, and then, of course, the great books. Now, books to recommend. Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes. Absolutely fantastic new book coming out on, um, uh, well, retelling the myths of Medusa, of course. And also um, the Perdicast years, 323 to 320, Tristan Hughes, going to just three years of history to understand what happens in the wake of Alexander the Great's death. Now, I promised you marriage, stag parties, marriage counselling um, and everything. And uh, Sarah said they had frog poison for marriage counselling. Wow, OK, where's the evidence, Sarah? Tell us everything. Uh, kind of, we want to hear where this has come from. But Tracy starts about the stag party. Bless you, Damien. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your kind comments. The stag party. Now, you've been having a look, Tracy, I think, at a website that claims that the origin of the stag party can actually be traced back to Sparta, um, where apparently the night before the celebration, the night before the wedding, um, there was a uh, celebration of the man as a soldier before he then went off to get married. The evidence on this kind of mm, is a bit, a bit dodged, to be honest. And the Spartan wedding is a weird one, full stop. So we know that kind of the whole thing about men in Sparta, male Spartan warriors, but they were living in an all-male enclosure, um, growing up, training together, living together. And actually, when they got married, they weren't really supposed to break from this. So there was a very weird setup in the early phases of a marriage whereby the bride sort of had, we think, her head shaven. She was dressed in male clothes. And then at the at night time, the man had to actually scuttle in unobserved and unseen into her tent, spend some time with her during the night, and then leave again to get back to his mates um, during the day. And then he would do this repeatedly for quite a while before the wedding and the marriage was actually kind of public and they would set up home together to the extent that it, people could be married in Sparta, we think, for quite some time before they'd actually ever seen one another necessarily in daylight. Um, uh, so yes, kind of Sparta, I think, kind of whether or not they had a stag do the night before is to be avoided as an example of how to do um, your wedding. Uh, now, weddings in Athens, we know, kind of all tended to happen. If you were getting married, it wasn't your choice of when you wanted to do it any time during the year. And people didn't actually tend to go for the summer months. In fact, there was a month, a particular month of the year that was um, very, very auspicious to have your wedding in. That was the month of Gamaleon, which actually kind of literally translates as marriage month, which is the equivalent of our January. 
Um, and that was the time um, that you really wanted to get married because that was the time that was set to worship of Hera, who actually, despite the fact she had a very, very difficult marriage with a very, very adulterous husband, Zeus, um, kind of actually uh, kind of was the goddess and who looked after and oversaw marriage. Um, and the marriage service itself was broken into three parts. So we had the Proaulia, and this was actually all based on the bride. This was the bride's feast um, back at her home in her father's house, uh, where she would do a series of religious observances to Artemis, to Athena, to Aphrodite, laying aside her childhood and her adolescence and becoming and um, preparing herself to become married. She would cut off a lock of her hair, for instance. Then there was the gamos, the actual handover of the bride from the father's or the guardian household to um, the husband's household that's the kind of wedding itself per se and then there's the so-called epaulia which is where they come up with all the gifts um, and bring those to the uh, kind of uh, uh, new um, bridal home but before all this happened there was a great process called the engesia and this was actually pretty much from a legal perspective the most important thing because this was where the deal was struck not between the husband-to-be and the bride-to-be, but between the husband-to-be and the guardian of the bride, father or other member of the family. This was where um, we actually kind of um, had to um, kind of strike the deal on kind of the dowry. Um, potential suitors would be chosen amongst, so we'd have to compete for the guardian to kind of offer up the hand in marriage, particularly to them. And it was through the engesia that the kind of legal contract, as it were, was drawn up that was then needed to be wrecked for that wedding and marriage to be recognised um, within law more generally. Okay, so we've got married. That's all good. Um, we may or may not have had a stag party. Sarah says, what's with all the head shaving? Uh, kind of no, is to make, I, I suspect, or the way it's inferred and thought about in Sparta is to make the the woman look as man-like or as male-like, dressing in male clothes as well as possible as part of this kind of weird sort of not letting a man out of his male company um, scenario. So yeah, let's not go down that road. There's a lot of unpacking that needs to be done there. Tracy, yes, your LSA Classics post on that on Instagram about the Gamalia. Yes, and the Gamalia in the month of Gamalion. Absolutely go and have a look at it. Now, Mariam Zadie's question is about marriage counselling. What happens if you get into trouble? Now, where would we go for evidence of this? We don't have a lot of it uh, kind of bar kind of we, we know that lots of things happened in weddings and there was lots of adultery uh, both in the gods and in real life. And we have lots of love poetry and all sorts of woe is me. She loves me. She loves me not. How do I get access, etc. But I think one of the best pieces of evidence here is actually oracular questions. Now, Miriam said, did they go to Delphi? We do hear from Plutarch that actually Delphi was overwhelmed with shy marry shall I sail um, kind of questions, right? But we don't have a lot of evidence for that because the literary sources aren't going to record just normal people rocking up to ask about their wedding. But at the Oracle of Dodona of Zeus, the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona, the way of recording your question was to write it on a lead tablet that was then actually deposited in the sanctuary itself. And we can dig up those tokens and read those questions. And there are some absolutely extraordinary ones. And we've got a couple of minutes just to really delve into the joy of this massive treasure trove of questions that really get us up to kind of what the concerns of real individual people were in the ancient world. So um, a couple, a Boeotian couple asked at the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona, by doing what can we guarantee happiness for themselves and a son, an offspring. Lots of questions come to the oracle asking about should I get married? Most of them by men asking, uh, will I get her if I ask? So wanting to get the gods on side before even going to try and win the hand of a particular girl. We've got um, fathers coming along and asking about, um, will my daughter be better off with ex-husband or Y husband, right? Or kind of not. How do I ensure my daughter's um, success and happiness? How do I keep her safe, right, from fathers? Um, and then uh, kind of we do also hear about kind of, should I marry this girl or another one? Should I marry now? Or should I marry later? Trying to make sure we've got the gods on side for the very particular um, situation that, that, uh, is, that this person had in mind. Um, and then we also hear in these questions about divorce. So it appears that people were going to the Oracle of Zeus of Dodona and saying, 
things like with the wife he has now or another would he do better and be more prosperous right kind of so saying kind of should we make a change would i succeed if i took another woman again these are all men asking these questions right um it's very very unclear from surviving evidence whether we have examples of women asking these questions in return we have one answer Actually, sometimes you had the question on one side of the tablet and then the answer that was given by the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona would be on the other side. And one of the answers that comes to the, um, should I stay with the wife I have now or choose another, is this, cherish the one you have, right? Which is an excellent bit of marriage counselling, I think, from the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona. So it's absolutely brilliant that we can get into um the mindset of individuals right at their moment. And of course, marriage questions, massive point of transition, massive decision for life. Um, and they obviously turned to their oracles to find out the best they could. Latifah's question about what happened to women who did not have children for any reason and how were they regarded in the ancient world? Well, one of those uh, oracular questions that we do know is from a woman at Dodona is actually from a widow and is asking to the oracle um, about whether she is going to be able to succeed as a widow on her own or whether she needs to take another husband. Should she strike out on her own for her life or not? Um, but for those who didn't end up getting married at all, didn't have children at all, it was a very perilous situation, particularly if their father's whole household couldn't look after them through um, the rest of their lives. And it was not a very pretty picture. So that's a bit of a downer note to finish on, but finish we must. It's our half an hour is up already. Um, but absolutely, we can share the article written by Robert Parker um, that looks and analyzes some of the ancient responses from the Oracle uh, uh, at Dodona. Um, and we can share that article with you through the Facebook page. So do shout out if you would like us to do that. It's an absolute joyous read to have a think about the shall I kind of marry questions and all of those, the shall I sail questions and trade and business, etc. Um, the real kind of nitty gritty of day to day existence that the ancients worried about and which of course reminds us just how like us um, they were or rather how they uh, kind of we are like them um, in our concerns. So next time I said 21st of April 5pm will be coming live from the Resonate Festival. Sorry there's such a gap before we meet again um, due to a couple of things that I can't reveal yet um, but hopefully we'll be able to show you in due course and I'll give you some hints about um, over Twitter if you uh, follow our uh, Prof MC Scott there in the next couple of weeks. Um, so keep that in mind but we will see you on the 21st of April at 5 p.m. And in the meantime, stay safe. Have a wonderful Easter if you are celebrating um, and look after yourselves and enjoy the sunshine. Take care. Bye-bye.